and hello everyone yeah welcome to our welcome to our webinar um so today we're going to be talking a bit about um some of the issues that we've come across in um in the research culture whilst we've been doing work on a new um a new platform that's designed to try and solve some of those issues um so first of all i think um we'll just run around each of our speakers uh, and give ourselves a quick introduction so you know who you're talking to um so i'm tim i'm the product manager for for octopus this new publishing platform that we're working on uh so it's my job to do various bits of publicizing the platform and also to look at how we can build this platform in the best manner to make sure that we're providing features that you know um reinforce and prioritize um the right sort of incentives for researchers to release good quality work um and i think i'll pass over to john next to talk Thanks, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is John Kay. I'm head of product in the Open Research Services team at JISC, and I work with Tim on developing Octopus. And I will pass over to Penn. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pen Yuan Xing, but you can just call me Pen. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bristol. Uh, I've been very lucky to uh, to have been running a set of evaluations for the Octopus platform in terms of research culture and how Octopus might fit into it. Uh, I will be talking about that soon, so I won't get into the details, but more generally speaking, I uh, am very interested in all aspects of open research and mother research on how we do science better. Thank you. And I think I'm the last one. So uh, thank you uh, for having me here today. My name is Evangelia, short for it, Evie Kotsiliti, and uh, I come from the University of Hertfordshire. I am the information manager in research and scholarly communications. And uh, today I'm going to share to you, uh, to share with you the feedback that we got from our researchers uh, when running Octopus workshops with them. Thanks for that, everyone. Um, so yeah, just to outline the, I suppose, the overall goals of this workshop, obviously for us, we'd like to understand in a bit more depth um, how people perceive Octopus as, as being able to solve some of the problems that they're coming across in research culture. And for yourselves, this is also a chance to have a bit of a discussion around what those problems are um, and see if we can find any sort of common themes and things like that. Um, so to outline the overall structure of this next section of the workshop, what we'll be doing is in about roughly half an hour or so we'll be going off into smaller groups to have a bit of a conversation about what we think the key issues are um in research publishing the research culture in general um the sort of practices those are leading to um but to sort of frame that and to give you something to think about um for that breakout session um pen's going to go through a bit of a talk um about what he's come across uh, during his recent work so over to you pen thank you tim all right, so I'm going to do a little presentation um, that I call um, setting the stage for the rest of today, right? Um, and since I am the first person to present during the workshop today, I thought I start uh, really, really zoomed out about uh, what, what open science and open research actually mean. And after that, the meat of my presentation today will really be about the evaluations I've been doing in terms of what research culture looks like right now. Uh, and then um, a little bit of reflection on where I think Octopus might fit into helping us make our culture even more conducive to doing better research. So uh, when it comes to open science and open research, my experience has been that if I ask 10 people what open science means, they will give me 10 different answers, right? So uh, at, at the beginning of today, I just like to synchronize uh, a little bit on uh, what I think open science means, and then we can use that definition in mind as we have the rest of our discussions today. And I like to think about uh, this in terms of the contrast between science and alchemy. And this is because I once read from uh, a very famous author called Cory Doctorow, who described you know, alchemy as, you know, alchemists who, what they, need, what they knew a secret from each other for 500 years. On the surface, you know, they seem to be doing experiments and research, right? But they never shared what they did with each other. And because of that, not only did they not advance the state of the art very much, but every single one of them have to learn in the hardest possible way that drinking mercury was a bad idea. And I think this really hits at the difference between science and alchemy because science is a fundamentally iterative process. 
what we always built on what came before. In fact, you know, uh, you know, doing science uh, is uh, has inherently this you know iterative nature to the extent that doing good science is open science, because by doing open science we are being responsible to the nature of science itself. And in practice, um, you know, having worked on this for so many years, I think open science means that we need to enable a set of practices that produce outputs that come with four fundamental re uh, freedoms for anyone to use that output, study it, modify it, and share it without any restrictions. And this is how I see open science and open research. And uh, in a more practical sense, you know, I think we're faced with so many challenging problems in the world today, whether it's you know, diseases or climate change or so many other problems. And they're so urgent and so global that we don't have time to be alchemists. And I think this is such an important point that we simply cannot afford to not do open research. And it is with that in mind that I you know, thought I was so lucky to have played a small role in Octopus by uh, running a set of evaluations over the past you know, half a year or so, uh, looking at what research culture looks like right now across different disciplines. And uh, a big part of that was running the survey uh, where I got responses from uh, more than 400 researchers across the world. Now, uh, admittedly more than 80% of, uh, 80 of those responses are from you know, across Europe, which includes the UK. Uh, slightly less than 10% came from North America and the rest came from the rest of the world. So it is pretty you know, European biased, but uh, I was really glad to see that these researchers represent 25 different fields of research in the social and natural sciences. Uh, I don't have time to go through every single question in the survey, so I'm just going to give you some of the highlights and what we could learn from it. The first one is that we asked, you know, at what levels do you feel the following aspects are present in your current research job, right? And, you know, rating those things from very low to very high, and then it turns out that more than 80% of respondents had you know, fairly high satisfaction uh, with the nature of the work that they're doing. On one hand, this seems encouraging, but on the other hand, more than half of them also feel like they have low to very low career prospects. And this is a, a sentiment that I've seen in so many researchers that uh, I've interacted with over the years, right? But the other question is that, uh, if you are near the beginning of your research, you know, let's say you have a research question or a plan to conduct that research, what factors might prevent you uh, from publishing or otherwise sharing aspects of your research that early on and then can choose from uh, different options? Uh, now, the biggest one is that almost half of them have this fear of their research being scooped. Uh, and I will go into more of this later. Um, about a third of them, don't know where they could share their research in these early stages. And another third of them thought there's no career benefit to them sharing you know, different aspects of their research. And I think this is also a very telling set of answers. Uh, the other answer, uh, a question is uh, about how much do you think the following factors you know, influence um, uh, you know, assessment uh, for funding and career advancement. So I think what's going on there is that, you know, almost two thirds of them think their publication record is the most important. Uh, while, you know, about half of them think that novelty and trendiness of their work is very important. And none of these are su very surprising, but I think what's particularly telling is that um, it is only after these three uh, factors that the rigor of the methods of your research uh, are considered to be a very strong influence. And I think this says a lot about how research is being assessed right now. So that was some of the results from our survey. And I'd like to talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, a set of interviews that I did uh, during this time. And I was very lucky to be able to talk to 14 researchers, again, from across the world. It's not just Europe and North America. It's also in Asia and Africa. Uh, they 
are, are some of them are early career researchers, some of them are later in their careers, uh, some are not academics, and they come from both the natural and social sciences. Uh, we talked about a lot of things related to research culture and how people share uh, outputs in their field. So what did we learn? Well, uh, it probably wouldn't come as a surprise to you that the biggest thing we've learned is that traditional peer review papers in journals are still the primary way of sharing research. And this typically happens near the end of research and you wrap all of that up into you know, a soundbitey uh, kind of um, narrative, right? But with that said, every single person I interviewed expressed this desire to share more from the research that they do, including in its early stages, such as the methodology, because they consistently say that they really would love to receive early feedback earlier, earlier in their research so that they can make improvements as early as possible uh, so they wouldn't you know, waste their time doing things that are not worthwhile. And they're very consistent in expressing this feeling. Uh, right, And one of them said, and I think this makes a lot of sense, that the process of how research is done is more important than the output because the process and how you do it is what you have control over. However, uh, most of people don't share anything beyond their papers, right? And I think uh, this quote is very, very telling in that, you know, if you're a successful person, you don't have time to do that. And this speaks so much, I think, to the incentive structures that we have to contend with. Now, some of the barriers to not sharing could be more personal, such as just this fear of embarrassment of sharing something that might be not very mature, or uh, some could be technical considerations. Uh, for example, some people simply don't know how to share data, share code, share their protocols, um, or some people have concerns, right, about maybe privacy. If I work, you know, with human subjects, uh, are there th certain things I shouldn't share? How do I think about that? Or uh, in another case, maybe I am, you know, a space-related kind of scientist, and I was sent a space probe to another planet. And uh, as part of our methodology, we have communications protocol for sending commands to the spacecraft. But if we share all of that, does that mean that maybe other people can also send commands to my spacecraft and, you know, redirect its trajectory to places where I don't want it to go, right? So, it, so, so, so there are so many different ways of thinking about these technical barriers. But in any case, the biggest issue is that most of the considerations are political in nature. Uh, and when it comes to political considerations, again, the biggest one is the sphere of research being scooped. And they talked about, roughly speaking, two different kinds of scooping. One is that people are just afraid of outright plagiarism, right? Someone else passing off their work, you know, as their own, you know, and not giving you the credit and attribution. Uh, another big one is that even if you can put your name on it, and even if other people cite you, someone else might beat you to being the first at something. And being first could be, you know, beating you to getting a, uh, a grant, you know, and getting funding, or beating you to publishing a paper, even if they cite you in that paper. Uh, and again, this all comes back to this obsession with papers of, uh, uh, by researchers because they can really make or break reviews, right? Everything revolves around papers, especially in assessments, whether that's the quali quality or the quantity of the papers, everything is based on uh, your papers. Uh, and people talk about having to strategically think about uh, uh, minimum publishable units, you know, to break down your research into as many papers as possible uh, so that, you know, you can really hit the metrics that you're required to hit. Uh, there's a lot of castle building that's going on where you keep your knowledge a secret, where you keep your capabilities a secret, where you keep other things like code and data a secret. And if other people want access to your capabilities or knowledge, they have to trade with you where you, know, you can negotiate on you know, the kind of authors that you can be on in return for giving them your data and so on. And there's so many political kind of maneuvering that happens that the people I interviewed have talked about. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of this lead to questionable research practices, right? Um, because everything uh, goes into that paper 
uh, and because there's so much, you know, this trading and uh, so much of this pressure that happens behind the scenes, um, at least to so many things. For example, I remember talking to this researcher who recalled when they were doing their PhDs, uh, they were pressured into uh, tweaking, you know, the code that they wrote for analyzing data in a way uh, that produces, you know, the quote unquote best looking results or, you know, changing the code so that it actually ignores part of their data uh, so that the final analysis would show a statistically significant result. And they actually broached their, uh, this concern to their PhD supervisor. And the supervisor literally told them, well, don't worry about it. I mean, no one's gonna see your code anyway. So, uh, uh, so, so it's fine. And they were so discouraged by this because they know this is unethical behavior but it's so normalized to the extent that PhD supervisors will tell their students to do this and that it is okay. Um, uh, another interesting uh, perspective is that because everything revolves around traditional you know, peer review papers, it really uh, creates a lot of pressure on reviewers of papers because for a lot of journals, for any particular submission, the other term I send it, to you know, maybe two referees, right? And those two referees hold so much power over the outcome of the, that paper and whether it's published. And because papers are so important, they can really make or break careers. Uh, on one hand, you know, I uh, I remember talking to this engineer. They were publishing a paper on construction material for buildings. Uh, but one of the referees for their paper said, "Oh, this you know is not useful for building aircraft." And that doesn't make sense at all because that's not what the paper is about. But regardless, their paper was rejected because of this review. Uh, on the other side, uh, I was talking to a researcher who uh, uh, was recalling their experience reviewing papers. And they feel so stressed because they know that uh, what they do can really affect someone else's career. And they're really scared of not doing uh, their review well enough. And they're really concerned about giving negative reviews because it could break someone else's career. Uh, and unfortunately, what all of this means is that it really doesn't matter uh, what you actually did and what the content of your work is, as long as you get your name on the paper, that's the thing that's most important. And because of that connections and prestige matter so much more than the content of your research. You know, one person said, you don't need to do anything. You just need to do, know the right people to get yourself on the right papers, and then you're all set. So the politics of authorships uh, 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 become a big problem here because it's not just being you know, an author, it's about where you are in the author list, right? Uh, for example, you know, one other researcher said um, when they were publishing their paper, they were pressured by their supervisor into putting someone in a very senior position on the author list ahead of them. Uh, and uh, the justification was that because they gave me, you know, a sample of drives, that's all they did. But because they're so senior, they need to have a very prestigious location in the author list. Or if you're lucky enough to have a Nobel laureate, you know, in your author list, then they need to go on the top just so that, you know, you get the attention of the journal that you're submitting to. On the other side of this, you know, a lot of people express this frustration uh, if, we're, if they're the quote unquote plumbers, you know, in research, then they do not get uh, the credit that they, that they deserve, right? And what this means is that, you know, in, um, in some cases, such as in the social sciences, uh, a lot of people would go to do field work in different places around the world and interview the people there. But because they're not from that place, they often hire these local fixers who have a lot of um, local knowledge and tacit understanding of the local situation. And they will facilitate and manage these interviews, but they get no recognition at all in authorship. Or in another case, um, there was this statistician, right? And uh, they were brought in to uh, a review, a paper that was being written. And turns out that uh, their comments completely changed you know, the direction of that paper and they rewrote huge chunks of it uh, to, to completely present it in a different way. They changed their analysis and all of that. And they actually submitted it to a different journal. So it was a very pivotal contribution. But because 
the other people in the research group thought the statistician was just a quote unquote plumber who just threw out a p value. This person didn't even end up as an author. They just ended up in the acknowledgement section of the paper. Uh, and you know, another thing about this kind of uh, interesting thing about this division of labor is that you know, one person was telling me about how you know, not only is labor and division of labor not recognized, but you know, so many people are asked to have to do everything really well. Like, why are you asking the rocket scientists to figure out how to do you know, a Zoom meeting? And what, it, what they mean is that, uh, especially as academics, once you get to a more senior position, you're expected to have to do everything so well. You have to teach really well. You have to do research really well. You have to publish in the highest profile journals. You have to mentor a lot of students from undergrads to master's students to PhD students. Uh, you have to take care of their welfare. You have to find funding for them. You have to constantly write grant proposals and you need to get really good marks on your teaching from the students and so on and so forth, right? And you're expected to have to do all of this so well uh, at the same time that there's no recognition for you know, all of these things that each on its own would be a really specialized skill. Now, uh, coming back to papers, uh, some people are talking about you know, using the clear with the credit guidelines to describe you know, the specific contributions of different authors in the paper. But even in that case, you know, nobody reads it. It has no impact. No one actually cares. And again, coming back to papers, there's such strong pressure for you to present what's called a good story, right? And some of them feel like I'm a novel writer instead of a researcher because there's pressure to make research very sound bitey. You know, it has to be very catchy, it has to sound sexy. And, uh, and, and that also leads to another question of practices. And you know, one person was really frustrated because they see early career researchers around them who want to see a change in this toxic research culture, but they're not in a position with the power to make that change happen. And by the time, if they are, you know, everyone's giving up. They're leaving research, especially academia. You know, one of them said that anyone with half a brain cell realizes that the academic system is not a level playing field, and they just get the hell out of Dodge as quickly as possible. So this sounds very negative, but I think it is very important for us to honestly you know, face the perverse incentives and the corrupt systems that we're working with. Now, uh, a lot of people I interviewed, you know, they have so many of these frustrations, but they try to suggest some changes as well, right? For example, uh, they think there should be more open critique in order to improve research. Uh, critique of research really shouldn't only happen uh, when papers are being reviewed. There should be more of a conversation. There should be more back and forth between reviewers and the person doing the research across the entire research life cycle. Uh, we should really value the division of labor more. Uh, you know, even if someone is considered a plumber, their work is also critical and it should be valued and attributed accordingly. Uh, and uh, ground success in the grounds. This one is interesting. So, you know, one person was pointing out that um, a lot of senior people get to review grant applications or papers, but sometimes they are so far removed from the actual, you know, hands-on kind of work that's happening that they might, you know, not be qualified to do the reviews anymore. So it should be the grounds success in the grounds, and that research is interdisciplinary, and we should recognize that. Uh, one, you know researcher who comes from a physics background, uh, but they do some medical related research, they are applying for funding, right? And uh, when they go to, for example, the EPSRC, it will say, oh, your system medicine thing, so you should apply for funding for the MRC. When they go to the MRC, they say, oh, your thing, you know, is not in the remit because it's clearly a physics thing, so you should go to the EPSRC, and so on. So we, our system is to recognize, you know, and, and enable, you know, interdisciplinary research. And the other one, I think this is really, really important where we should assess assessments and how they're run. You know, we talk so much about uh, reproducibility and scientific rigor when it comes to the discipline specific research that we do, but we haven't applied that same kind of rigor uh, to how we run assessments and really put assessments under the microscope. 
to see whether they're doing what we want them to do. So uh, these are some of the results and just a few highlights from the interviews that I did. But where does octopus fit in this really toxic and corrupt research culture that we have to put up with? So, um, you know, Octopus, as you will be hearing about later today, is a new platform for sharing, you know, open research across the research lifecycle. And where it goes, I think, can be thought of in this um, uh, pyramid of culture change uh, that Brian knows it from the Center of Open Science likes to talk about. So uh, the way this pyramid works is that at the very top, you have policy level uh, decisions on making things required, right? This really lays out a lot of incentives. Uh, and incentives can make certain uh, be kinds of behavior more rewarding than others. And it is with, you know, these kind of high level kind of directions that uh, we can have communities of practice of researchers where certain behaviors become normal for people to do and certain things become unacceptable. However, to make all of this work, right? We require fundamental infrastructure that enables it. It could be the experience of sharing research. It has to be easy enough for people to do if they want to. And to make it easy, we need to make it possible first, right? There's this fundamental infrastructure, whether it's soft infrastructure or hard infrastructure, we need to make it possible. And in my opinion, it is, you know, at these fundamental levels where octopus can really come in to not only make it possible for you to share different aspects of your research, but hopefully also to make it easier for you. So uh, looking at that pyramid, I think what this means is that octopus on its own, it might not be sufficient to change the corruption in our system right now, but it could be a valuable, necessary part of the whole set of solutions that we can hopefully come up with together. And I hope that you know, for the rest of today's workshop, you know, we can keep this in mind as we reflect on not only current research culture, but also how Octopus uh, could you know, be improved to help us realize, this, uh, realize the changes we want to see. All right, so that's my little presentation. Thank you, Tim, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, and I believe I'm unmuted, so that looks promising there. Right, thank you very much for that, Ben. Um, so the next step, um, now that we've had a bit of a talk about what some of the um, sort of perceived issues in the research culture are, is we're going to hop into some smaller group discussions, probably about 10 or 15 people in each, and we're going to have a, a bit of a conversation about what what your experiences have been in research culture, what you feel the core issues are, and try and see if we can come up with, um, I suppose, some of the, the key points of things that need to be addressed in the research culture. Um, so. I will, um, Will, are you okay to uh, to move us through? And we'll take sort of five minutes for this. Um, we'll have a, have a document that you can sort of jot down your thoughts in, um, and then we'll try and discuss them as a group and, uh, and see what we come up with. Yep, I will move people into breakout rooms now. Brilliant, thank you. I believe we're back in the room. Right. Looks like most people have made it back now. So, um, yeah, I hope that was um, that was useful for you. Um, what we're going to do now is, um, if you want to try and keep some of those ideas in mind as we go through the next section, um, we're going to have a look at Octopus, um, both sort of in concept uh, and then in practice as a solution with a little bit of a demo. Um, and it'd be interesting just for you to see whether or not um, whether or not it's addressing some of those issues that you've that you've come up with there, um, and perhaps take a look at whether there's some places where certain changes may be needed or certain things maybe need to be done for it to address those issues and things like that. Um, so next up, I'll pass over to John, uh, and he's going to give us a little bit of an introduction to what Octopus is trying to do in principle. I'm going to give a, uh, a kind of very short kind of introduction on uh, kind of uh, what Octopus is and kind of um, how, how Octopus is, is, uh, is structured. Um, but yeah, kind of uh, Octopus is uh, being developed jointly but, um, by um, JISC and Octopus CIC. And Octopus CIC being led by Octopus's founder, um, Dr. Alexandra Freeman, who's at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're funded by UKRI and are kind of working in partnership with the UK Reproducibility Network. 
Um, so um, very kind of quickly on this one, because Pan did a, a an, an uh, excellent job kind of um, outlining the kind of context that we're that we're in, um, and kind of th this audience probably doesn't need uh, kind of me to to, to say that yeah, kind of the last few years have um, sparked some kind of major discussions within the re research community around fundamental ele elements of, of kind of research culture, integrity, um, practice. Uh, there's kind of initiatives that are happening. So kind of the future of re uh, research assessment, um, consulting to kind of review future uh, approaches to assessment and opportunities to kind of refine the ref um, and other incentives. Um, there's uh, yeah, kind of studies into um, research integrity, um, formation of kind of uh, UK uh, committee on research integrity, uh, and also fairly kind of big. Um, so COVID-19 kind of brought many um, many of these kind of issues and, and problems to, um, to the fore, such as kind of, you know, the speed of um, sort of publishing kind of re uh, research findings or kind of research as it's, as, as it's happening. Um, and yeah, the importance of kind of uh, quick and open access to the, to the latest science. Um, so yeah, kind of that's um, obviously kind of highlighted some kind of issues there around kind of um, research culture quality um, and uh, and reproducibility, as well as, yeah, kind of all of the kind of culture issues that, that Penn raised around kind of the incentives, career career pressure, kind of leading to kind of things like kind of um, questionable um, research practices, um, yeah, kind of reliance on kind of just putting out the, the publication and, um, yeah, kind of, um, uh, possibly not kind of seeing uh, the publishing the steps for as something kind of needed, but also maybe seeing that as a yeah, kind of a threat to kind of any um, uh, kind of uh, sort of career based kind of prestige by being by being uh, by being scooped. Um, so in response to kind of this this uh, uh, context, um, Octopus is a um, a new platform um, set up to kind of share primary research. Where the academic community can fr uh, freely read, uh, review, and um, register their work. Um, crucially, kind of Oxford's publications are not intended to be um, paper full papers. Um, it is designed to be a um, primary research record, a kind of patent office for scientific work, where the emphasis is kind of uh, on recording the work in full as it happens. And on um, providing a place to share kind of research outputs that have um, traditionally st struggled to find a home. So things like kind of small scale data sets or kind of file draw hypotheses. Um, as these aren't kind of papers, they don't require um, researchers to provide kind of narrative in the same way as a paper. So kind of these outputs are not about kind of the, the writing skills. It's all about the, the, the kind of factual content. And kind of how that uh, has kind of um, come from the, the, um, the the steps and science preceding it. Um, key to this idea uh, um, of, of, of Octopus is kind of breaking up the, um, the paper as the main unit of publication. So um, Octopus has um, eight smaller output, uh, output types. So hence the name Octopus, it's got kind of, yeah, eight, eight uh, uh, arms, um, which are uh, designed to match the kind of uh, the stages of uh, the research process. So these um, uh, outputs are um, on the uh, right hand side of, of this slide and um, we start off uh, the process by kind of um, defining a research problem. Um, we in, in, in the system, we have kind of seeded the system with um, a, a number of research problems, some more detailed than others, depending on the domain. We have kind of um, a lot in the kind of, um, sort of psychology, um, medical field and I think kind of some um, uh, physics as well that are um, uh, kind of uh, extracted from, from the literature. But some of the problems at the moment are basically kind of research topics that um, more detailed problems can be can be joined onto. Um, so every kind of um, uh, chain, so to speak, in Octopus, and I'll, I'll outline that, that concept in a little bit more detail um, shortly, begins with a research problem, which you can then kind of attach a hypothesis uh, or kind of rationale to. Um, following on from that, the kind of different steps in the in the scientific process, moving on to kind of methods, uh, publishing the data and results, publishing the analysis, uh, interpretation, and real world application. So we have these kind of seven kind of key uh, building blocks of the um, sort of scientific process, and the eighth uh, public publication type is a uh, peer review. Um, peer review is a yeah kind of publication in, in its own right on Octopus. Um, it gets a kind of DOI and an author, and it's kind of fully uh, available there. 
So hopefully kind of that will provide an incentive to kind of um, for folks to kind of uh, to peer review because you can kind of point to, to that effort. You can um, point to your contribution there. Um, and yeah, hopefully it will, it will um, kind of get, get folks to see that kind of peer reviewing is a kind of skill in its own right and shouldn't be kind of buried uh, within a kind of editorial um, process. Um, so yeah, kind of key to kind of octopus <clears throat> Is is that um, as as Penn mentioned, kind of science is iterative. Um, so uh, yeah, kind of each step does uh, kind of uh, come um, come from another, starting from the kind of um, the uh, the the, um, uh, the problem and, and moving through uh, that chain. Um, and you might kind of yeah uh, end up with a kind of dead end somewhere. You might kind of uh, write a kind of protocol to a hypothesis. That, that yeah kind of is uh, I don't know, you, uh, can't implement or um, uh, yeah kind of uh, or carry out for another reason so that might be the end of that chain at the protocol um, and yeah you might have kind of um, sort of many kind of um, uh, different um, item types and many different kind of protocols to, to to look at one one hypothesis um, and each of those kind of items doesn't need to be um, authored by the by the same person it could be the yeah kind of um, Different research groups. It could be um, collaborators. It could be people that have never heard of each other before. Um, so it's all open out in the public, and chains can be kind of formed and and grown by um, uh, by uh, different authors and and uh, and contributors. Um, so um, yeah, kind of the, this basically um, uh, kind of shows that yeah, the um, uh, uh, the, if you, uh, if it breaks it down into, into its into its constituent parts. People have kind of talked about, um, uh, sorry, um, Penn's mentioned it, it came up in, in in our group as well about kind of um, uh, the credit system and how that might not be working uh, currently. Um, it might be the kind of yeah, the specialisms that are uh, kind of um, more relevant to different parts of the research process. Instead of getting a kind of you know credit on on that um, uh, part of the paper, they can be kind of sort of primary author. On 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 that um, side of things, so you probably can get a kind of a a, a fairer um, uh, a view of the effort of the effort um, uh, in in the whole process. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a lot a, a lot more kind of sort of flexible in 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 that regard, and um, yeah, kind of as I say, kind of open, and you can yeah kind of carry on build chains on top of other people's works, start your own chains by kind of putting out your out your um, research problem. Um, Tim will in the demo will kind of show how these uh, kind of sort of chains and links are, are kind of um, are built in in a um, practically within Octopus. Um, it is it is kind of sort of central to that that concept. Uh, one one thing in this is that it does need to be kind of linked to a preceding step. So uh, moving down this diagram, uh, if you wanted to publish data, it has to have a protocol that it came from you can't just start with a kind of yeah, a um output or, um, about data that isn't attached to anything else so you always need you you can always see the sort of foundations of the um of the work and and what preceded it um so that is kind of the kind of key concepts um behind octopus um i've mentioned that we are yeah kind of working with um uh, octopus cic to deliver this as well as kind of um uh, UKRN, UKRI. Um, we are also kind of um, uh, integrating with um, uh, systems to kind of help uh, researchers um, connect with with other systems. We started with the kind of um, sort of uh, main uh, scholarly communication systems, so kind of ORCID uh, data site to kind of plug Octopus into the um, uh, the scholarly communication system. We are talking to other research software suppliers about um, partnerships and. Kind of automatically generating certain types of kind of octopus outputs and by vice versa in in other systems so hopefully that that, that list will grow uh, and just a very quick word on kind of uh, engagement and and where we are so um at the moment we are like uh, we're putting a lot of effort into growing octopus's uh, user base um we have a um, user uh, community we've set up a, an ambassadors group and a um a critical friends panel uh, and we're carrying out various activities around kind of um, uh, research engagement, reaching out to kind of um, funders, uh, universities, presenting at kind of conferences and meetings. So you, you, uh, if you haven't already, you probably kind of see us getting out and about. 
Um, but we do have a user community and uh, you can find out kind of how uh, you can get involved in that uh, at that kind of URL, oxbus.ac, uh, get involved. So um, yeah, if you're, if you're kind of interested in um, contributing more, or if you have any ideas for us about how to kind of get um, uh, uh, kind of researchers involved in Octopus or, or um, want to kind of invite us into your kind of institution to give demos and things like that, please kind of uh, uh, contact us. And uh, yeah, kind of you can uh, talk with Tim and I um, uh, using those details there. Um, so that's my very quick kind of run through about um, the kind of underlying concepts for, for Octopus and I'll hand back to Tim. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, so we've been going for just coming up on an hour now. So before we um, we jump into what the platform actually looks like in practice, um, I think what probably makes sense is if we just take um, just take maybe a five minute break or something. I know people normally round it to a, a round number of time, but I think that would mean we'd be taking a bit of a longer one. So if we say um, let's pause and perhaps come back at sort of two minutes past um, two, and then we'll run through uh, what the platform actually looks like. So thanks for that, everyone, and see you in a few minutes. OK, so I'll jump into it. Um, and I think the first thing to um, to look at here is the way Octopus breaks um, the traditional concept of a research paper down into smaller component pieces. Um, so you can see along the top here, we've got seven um, seven types of publication, I suppose, that you can see listed out, starting with a research problem um, and moving through to a hypothesis, a method, results, and so on. Um, one, one important thing to note here is these terms, um, we're using them at the moment um, to try and describe what each of these uh, publication types are. They may not necessarily be the correct terms for your specific discipline. Octopus is designed to work for or research of all disciplines, but at the moment it is using a language that is perhaps slightly more STEM facing. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do in consultation with the community is come up with much more broad terms, I suppose, that could sum up what that type of publication, what that step in the research process is, regardless of the discipline. So as you can imagine, results may look quite different if you're um, you know, a historian or um, an art researcher or something, as opposed to a, you know, a neuroscientist, for instance. Um, you can see here each of these have been published in stage so that the research um, project that is as it is has started out with a research problem what needs to be looked at what is the, the question essentially it's then moved into a hypothesis a method results analysis and so on as these step-by-step -step pieces that have been published uh, or can be published in turn as they're conducted so you can um, you can bring things onto the platform once they're ready without needing to wait until you've got the entire piece uh, project done um, a, a big thing to note here is I'm currently viewing this method. Um, this method is naturally derived from the hypothesis that was um, published prior. But if I hop over to this hypothesis here, we'll see something slightly different come up. We'll see that as well as that uh, method that, that I was on originally, we also have um, this other method that's been published here. Um, so in this case, uh, what's happened is there's been a hypothesis published and someone's gone along and they've published a method for it. But someone else has come along and decided actually they think there's a slightly different way to test that hypothesis. So in this case, um, instead of using online surveys to test the hypothesis, they've gone for using um, qualitative interviews. Um, and that's been taken through to its own thread of research, so its, its own results and its own analysis run on them. Um, and in, in this case, those two have been tied back together into a single interpretation. Um, I suppose one important thing to note here is they don't necessarily have to be tied back together. So it could be that that thread of research is being conducted by a completely separate team and they want to run their own interpretation on what they've come up with, still giving derivation to that hypothesis that it stems from, but ultimately they're not tying it back together into any single point. They're just taking it off in a completely separate thread of research alongside um, the original one. Um, similarly, uh, in this case, I do happen to know that this team um, they did publish both of these methods. They are the same research group, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, the way Octopus works is that anyone with an ORCID profile can publish on the platform and they can indeed attach a publication to something that's already on the system, which means that I, if I found uh, this hypothesis particularly interesting, despite being unrelated to this research team, I could come in here and I could hit this option that you can see down at the bottom right of my screen here to write a linked method. And I could suggest my own method for this hypothesis and bring it out as my own thread. Um, and what that means is you can use Octopus not just as a place to publish your work early and get feedback on it early, but also as a place to discover potential things that you would like to research, um, which brings me into quite a big aspect of how the system fits together um, broadly, I suppose. So 
But at the moment, we're looking at um, what we call a research chain, which is one single thread of publications, as I said, starting with the research problem, moving all the way through to this real world application that we have right down at the end there. Um, but on a higher level, research problems themselves um, are also linked to each other. Um, so the idea here is that um, all human knowledge and all research is derived from something else. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's something that came before. Um, and what we've done is if I open a new tab up here, and I just head over to this URL. Um, so we obviously can't model in the system all human research, all human knowledge. That would be very ambitious. Um, so instead, we've included the Library of Congress classification outline is a series of research problems that stem from a single point and branch out getting more granular as they go. So for instance, if I hop into medicine, for instance, I'll see some more granular items under here and so on. I, I can dig down into these and get to more and more specific areas, perhaps pathology, um, until I find somewhere where I actually want to attach my research problem to. Um, as well as attaching it to these topics, you can also attach it to any other publication in the system. So I could, for instance, have a look at this uh, analysis over here, and I could decide that actually, as much as this is part of this existing piece of research, I think there's a question that's been implied as part of this work that deserves its own research. And so I, either as the original author of this um, publication, or as someone else who giving derivation to that um, publication that you can see here and those authors wants to take it into a different strand, I can hit this option down here and write a linked research problem. And that would essentially create um, a new starting point for another chain of research stemming out from this. And so between these two things, this network of publications, uh, sorry, network of topics that sort of models all disciplines of research and the ability to build on existing problems and existing publications elsewhere in the system, there should be a good place for you to put virtually any form of research, any research problem that you'd like to start um, start working on the platform. Um, to make it a bit easier to find things, we've also seeded the platform with about seven and a half thousand research problems that can be explored to see if you can find inspiration for your next piece of research, if that's the way you choose to go. Um, there's a few other important things to note on the page here before I dive into how publishing actually works on the platform. Um, so first of all, you can see our authors down here. Um, each author, as I said, is an ORCID profile, and I can hop onto this profile to have a look at a few things. So I can see information from that user's ORCID page, um, and I can also see information about the publications and things like that that they've made on the platform itself. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a moment. But one other thing I should note. So we're breaking the idea of a research paper down into smaller component pieces that can be published sequentially as they happen, effectively. Um, now, what that means is it gives us a lot of scope for um, greater greater or I suppose more granular attribution of who has done what. So you can see in this author list, we have uh, G. Rachia here. Um, and on this analysis publication in particular, you can see that G. Rachia is the sole author of this publication. We have different author lists for different um, publications, even within the same chain. Um, so this is quite useful because a lot of um, specialized roles within research um, you may find that they'll end up part way down an author list. So if, for instance, you're a data scientist and you, you generally just crunch the numbers on a piece of research, it may be quite unusual for you to be the first author on a publication because there are other people working on the project too and they get precedence for whatever reason. With Octopus, instead you get your own publication that can um, represent the specialized work that you're doing where you can be the first author um, and be recognized for the specialist um, skill set that you have. Um, a few other things to note on here. So Octopus uses open peer review. Um, peer reviews are treated as being um, just as valuable as, as any other publication type. Um, so just as I can add on my linked research problem if I wanted to derive something from this, um, or my interpretation if I wanted to publish a new sort of step in this chain, um, I can also come down here and click this option to write a review. And that would let me um, add a peer review to this publication, as you might expect. And again, uh, with this specialization in mind, um, because I'm doing a peer review specifically of an analysis, I can um, perhaps if I'm, again, if I'm someone who specializes in analytics, I can write a much more, um, a much more specific peer review about the analysis of this research rather than the paper in general. Um, there are a few other quality feedback mechanisms that we have in place. So naturally, Octopus um, is posed to be a place where quality is the primary incentive for researchers. So as well as uh, releasing peer reviews, we've added a few other mechanisms to make sure that people can get quality feedback on their work and also to make sure that people uh, can tell which pieces of research on the platform are of a high quality. Um, 
So one other one we have down here is flag a concern with this publication. So this is to be used if you have major concerns about a particular aspect of this publication. So let's say I think I see something amiss here, perhaps it's plagiarism. I can hit that uh, button down in the bottom right corner um, and this will open this option to raise a red flag. And what this will do is it will mark against that publication that someone's raised a red flag, everyone can see that, and it will also open up a dialogue between myself and the authors of this publication where we can discuss that red flag and potentially resolve it. Um, so it's just another mechanism for perhaps providing some feedback about a more specific concern than a general peer review. Um, the third piece of quality feedback um, functionality we have is um, it's still in the, the planning stages at the moment because we need to make absolutely certain we get this right. Um, essentially, what we're planning on doing is adding about three criteria to each type of publication. So they would they would differ depending on which publication type you're viewing. Um, perhaps for um, let's say for a data set, it could be the um, the size of the data set, whether it's a large enough data set to accurately test the hypothesis. Um, it could be whether the data is well annotated and it could be whether the data is readily available, perhaps. Um, those three metrics would then be um, available for readers to score on a sort of one to five scale or something along those lines for each publication that they view. <clears throat> and the, the idea here is that we'd be able to build up, um, I suppose, an aggregate, a, a score for the perceived quality of that publication um, according to readers. So um, there are, I suppose, a few benefits. This, first of all, it means we have something numeric we can use to assess the quality of publication. Um, it means we have a way that people can give feedback in relatively, in a relatively non-time consuming manner. And third, um, this can be applied to peer reviews as well. So Octopus has open peer reviews. Anyone can leave one on the platform and they're not anonymous. Um, so we need to make sure that peer reviews are also beholden to quality metrics to make sure that they are providing some meaningful feedback on a publication. Um, so again, just like all of the other types of publication, they would be given this quality metric system so that people could score them and make sure that they look like a, a realistic portrayal of um, a, realist, a reasonably good um, example of feedback for that publication. Um, as all of these quality feedback mechanisms uh, can be used by anyone who is a user of the platform, we need to make sure that there's some sort of accountability for how they're used. Um, so on top of each of these feedback mechanisms, we'll be um, making sure that there's visibility for how those are being used against each user's accounts. So I briefly showed you what an Octopus profile looks like. Um, red flags, peer reviews, and quality metrics will all also show up on um, a user's profile here so that you can have a look at how people are rating perhaps you can make sure that they're not always rating the same person's publication low or something like that and just keep an eye out for whether or not um, people are using those um, those feedback mechanisms responsibly a um, couple of other quick things to note here all of our license type are naturally um, cc by four they're open access publications um, each one gets a doi so each of these publications separately has its own DOI for that publication. They are a standalone item rather than being part of a greater whole. Um, and I believe that's it. John, um, feel free to unmute if there's anything else you wanted to throw in there. Um, but I think that's about everything on here. Uh, so uh, not not me, but um, there's some uh, questions in the chat, Tim. Um, one about kind of resolving red, red flags, especially. So. Let's have a look at that. Ah, so that does show up immediately, that red flag. Um, the idea is um, to give people a fairly a fairly major form of feedback if they have a very pressing concern with that publication. Um, from there, so one, one other thing I didn't mention actually is um, the reversioning system. So um, another feature we're going to be introducing to the platform is uh, the ability to create a new version of your existing publication. I'm now segueing slightly away from your question, sorry, Amy. Um, the idea with this um, this function is Octopus is a place to get uh, feedback on the quality of your publication. So we need a way for you to act on that feedback. Um, so we'll be adding a function where you can take your existing publication and in collaboration with the other authors on there, work to release a new version of it, which would then be published um, published to, uh, to the platform and users would then be able to switch between the two. So we need to make sure that um, whilst um, you can make changes to your publication and improve the quality of it. We also don't bury um, perhaps more negative feedback that you've received previously. So readers will be able to switch between the new version and older versions to see how it's changed over time as well. Um, 
but yes, in answer to your question, Amy, um, at the moment, they do just appear immediately on people's profiles. Um, and obviously, again, like the other feedback mechanisms, that is then recorded on the profile of the user who raised it as well. So you can see um, who raised that red flag and how they're, how they're behaving. So you um, you can the dialogue between the person that's flagged the publication and the author um, is is um, open for everyone to to see as well. So um, if there is a kind of discussion and disagreement around that red flag, you will be able to kind of view that publicly, uh, and that is also kind of um, on uh, folk profiles. Um, but yeah, I mean you are right. There could well be um, uh, abuse if someone yeah kind of. Um, uh, disagrees with with the stance, but that could also be yeah, kind of um, again further disagreed with the with the author. To remove a red flag, it does uh, require the person that actually um, uh, set the flag to be um, happy with any kind of resolution and kind of author, author's uh, explanation. Thanks, John. Um, so we've got a couple more questions from Michelle and. Um... Fiona, I think what we might need to do is revisit those at the end, just because I think we may be running a little bit short on time for this section. Um, so what I'll do next is I'll just quickly run through publishing. Um, and I think I can answer Fiona's question inadvertently here at the same time. So um, let's say you have a research problem that you want to add to the platform. Um, these can be added to any publication. So um, I could, for instance, go and find one of those categories that um, I was talking about earlier, perhaps for a specific uh, disease or something like that. And I can add a new research problem to that, or I can add it onto any other existing publication in the system. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll hop over the to the test site to make sure I don't end up publishing anything live. Um, and I'll hit this option here to get started with publishing. And I'll try and run through this relatively quickly. Unfortunately, the test site is a little bit slower than the live site. So let's put in a title for our publication. And we'll make sure that it's selected as a research problem. And we'll hit create. And this will take me through to a workflow where I can add key information about my publication. Um, I'll go through this and just show you a bit of an example of the sort of things you're able to add. Um, so first of all, we have our license type, obviously. Um, and then down here, we have um, the ability to add our affiliations. So these are pulled in directly from the user's ORCID profile. So let's just Go ahead and pop that in there. Um, next up, we need to make sure we're linking this to an existing publication somewhere on the platform. Um, so let's say um, let's say we're deriving it from this existing research problem here. All we need to do is hit add there, and that will um, link it to that existing piece and sort of give um, give credit to that publication as the place where this one stems from. Uh, next up, we've got main text. This is fairly straightforward. It's just a text editor. Um, you can import from a Word document and things like that as well if you want to. Um, references we have down here. So let me show you what this does quickly. Let's say I have a series of references that I'm pasting, and this is obviously not a very realistic example. But if I'm perhaps I'm using a big Word document full of loads of references and I want to get them in the system quickly in a way where they're then going to be manageable, I can paste them into this um, box here and hit Add. And it will split them out into separate line items with their own DOI stripped out, which means we have nice quality metadata um, by knowing exactly which DOIs you're referring to. And it also means you can do things like edit these individually, um, delete these individually, or add new ones to your list with this option here. Um, next up, we have uh, our conflict of interest statements. Um, there are various other statements that you can make for different types of publications. So for instance, for um, a method publication, you'd need to make um, an ethics statement to say whether or not you require ethics approval and whether or not you've got it, um, and things about whether you're pre-registering pre -registering your hypothesis and so on. So just some, um, some statements to make about exactly what you're doing, what stage you're at in the process, and things like that. Um, funders, you can add information about any funding you've received for this um, publication here. It's relatively straightforward. You use a raw ID or the key information about that funder. And then finally, we have our co-authors workflow. So I'll just quickly add in the email of my co-author here, my accomplice. Um, and if I want them to be the first author, I can drag them up the list just like that. I can obviously add in um, many more authors and rearrange them in this list as I choose. Uh, and if you're particularly eagle-eyed, you'll have noticed that this button up here that said publish previously um, now says request approval. So what I can do is I can click that and hit the option to um, request approval from my colleague here. And this is going to send out a request to that colleague um, to come in and approve the publication. And I think 
in the interest of time, I'll probably call it there. Um, I'll just quickly show you the page that we get to once we've uh, requested approval. At this stage, um, the other author is then invited to come into the publication, have a look at it to make sure they're happy with it. Um, and as you can see here, I can track um, what they're doing. So whether they've taken a look at the publication and they're, they're happy with me, get, me going ahead and publishing, um, whether they've entered their affiliations and things like that. Um, and once they've given this their thumbs up, once all the authors of the publication have given it their thumbs up, I can publish. Obviously, we need to make sure that people can't publish with another author on that publication without requesting their approval and getting some sort of sign off from them first, because we don't really want things being associated with people's ORCID profiles that they have no way of controlling. Uh, and that just suddenly appears on there because someone's added them. Um, and yes, that's pretty much the entire publishing process. Um, so I think that's uh, about it for my demo. Uh, what we'll be doing next is we'll be going back into our breakout rooms uh, that we were in previously, and we'll be having a little bit of a look at whether um, the ideas and the issues that you came up with in the last breakout uh, session, whether or not those are being addressed by Octopus, if you can see any ways um, that Octopus may be able to tackle them or to alleviate some of those issues, or, or if not, ways that it perhaps could hypothetically. Um, so yes, let's hop back into our breakout rooms. Right, it looks like everyone's back in now. Um, so next up, I'll pass over to Evangelia, and she's going to have a little bit of a talk about um, some of her experiences um, sort of introducing the platform to Octopus and what she's found there. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, we run a number of workshops at my institution, the University of Hertfordshire, and we also um, had a talk with um, uh, senior school leads. And today I would like to share with you the feedback that we got from our research community uh, when uh, discussing Octopus with them. To give you some background information, we have some information about Octopus on our internal portal pages. But these pages, we realize they don't get too much uh, attention. So last year, around October, we were notified about some available funding towards the enhancing research culture. And this is when we decided with our team that it would be a very good idea to submit an expression of interest towards the promotion and engagement with, uh, with Octopus. And the reason why we chose Octopus is because as a new open research platform and this uh, unique design of breaking up the different pieces of research and giving credit to all of these different pieces of research, we felt that it would be of interest to our research community and particular to our um, early career researchers and PhD students who are now establishing the way that they are conducting and communicating, publishing their work. Uh, in addition, the principles around Octopus, the quick, transparent sharing of ideas and outputs, and uh, in recording the different pieces of the research process in, uh, in much detail to enable reproducibility, it was fitting perfectly with some of the areas of interest of the funding call, and those were furthering open research practices and improving research conduct and reproducibility. So as part of our expression of interest, we included a number of activities, and those were to run a number of workshops for our early career researchers and PGR students, and develop training materials that we could enhance our portal pages with. And through our engagement with our researchers, try to identify if there are any barriers of using the platform, or if they feel that there could be uh, some additional features that they would like to see in the platform and feed those back to Octopus, the Octopus team, uh, for further uh, platform uh, improvement. And um, ultimately, what we, would, uh, what we were hoping for is that we could get a number of students to engage with the platform and develop case studies that we can then again post on our portal pages to spark more interest across the research community. So once we uh, were notified that our proposal was successful, the first step was to design the workshops for uh, the PGRs and ECRs. And at that point, we felt that it would make most sense to contact the Octopus GISC team to make them aware of our little project and what we are trying to achieve. And we also put together some um, 
some elements uh, of the system that we wanted to double check our understanding around them, um, as that would give us maximum um, confidence that what we what we uh, communicate to a research community is right. And that meeting was very helpful for us because not only we managed to dissolve any areas of ambiguity, but also we were supported in our um, efforts with materials that we used to uh, design to shape our workshops. We also liaised with the doctoral, school, uh, the doctoral college in our institution for the promotion of the workshops. The doctoral college runs the research and development program and we were very fortunate that our workshops were included as part of that program. We also communicated uh, the workshops via other communication outlets like our research newsletter, uh, communication with uh, senior school leads, but um, having our workshops in that uh, research and development program really um, enhanced the visibility of these workshops. We delivered two workshops in April, the one was face to face and the other one was online. And in general, there was very good representation across the different schools. And the majority of the people, majority of the researchers, they were from the life and medical sciences and the business school. Uh, with help from doctors college, in, when you know having discussions and events with uh, people in the schools, uh, they identified also um, a PGR student and an ECR um, uh, researcher uh, with whom we had a one-to-one -one workshop. And overall, I have to say that the attendees were very engaging. And I think one of the key factors that contributed to that was the way that we had structured, structured the workshops. Uh, we tried to make them as interactive as possible with having uh, questions addressing to the audience uh, throughout the, the length of the workshop. At the first part of the workshop, we gave an introduction to open research, open research practices, the open research landscape, because we wanted to make sure that our researchers get the broader picture of where Octopus uh, fits in. And at the point where we uh, discussed the open research practices, I asked my audience how familiar they were with these open research practices. And it was very positive to see that the majority had a very good level of understanding as 70% of the attendees uh, that were aware of these practices and half of those they have implemented an open research practice. And of those that they were mentioned during the workshop, it was publishing an open access article, uh, sharing the underlying uh, data and code. Uh, it was pre-registration and posting their work in a preprint server. I think having this engagement with the audience was very uh, useful for the people who attended the workshop because they were able to understand and to, to listen to the personal experience of people who have uh, implemented open research practices and how this benefited them as a researcher. Uh, there was an example of a researcher who said that they have recently uh, published an article, Open Access, and that particular article had a lot more engagement, a lot more attention than the other papers that they had published known open access. And another student from the business school had done um, open access uh, paper and underlying data and code. And when I asked the student uh, why, uh, how did they know about all of these things, they said that this was uh, after consulting uh, the supervisor. And that shows the importance that it's, it's important that the researchers in different stages of the career, they need to be quite aware of, um, of what is available in terms of open research. Um, at the second part of the workshop, we focused on the uh, platform itself. So we gave an overview, the main characteristics, how it is designed, the problems it can tackle, the benefits to the researchers, and then we brought up Octopus on the screen and started navigating so that um, the audience can get a feel of how it looks and how it works in practice. And towards the end of the, um, of the workshop, I asked, the, I asked my audience, what is the one thing about the platform that you like the most? And some of the answers are those that I was expecting to see about 
the ability to share the results quickly, that enables collaboration, that it is easy to find other related research. But the two comments that they stood out to me was um, the comment by the researcher saying, this is how research should be done. And that particular researcher was from the Department of Psychology and um, he was fully aware about the reproducibility crisis in their discipline and the ways that they're trying to become more open researchers to tackle those problems and uh, the fact that they are doing pre-registration that in their school they have an open research dedicated team that helps them to be an open researcher the other uh, comment that also stood out was the one from a researcher in the biomedical sciences who said that uh, she liked the fact that the methods are, and every single piece of the research process, it is described in so much detail in Octopus because from her experience reading papers in her field, the methods, uh, they could be so um, poorly described that it was almost impossible to replicate the experiment. At the end of the workshop, we had time uh, for um, the audience to ask questions. And uh, as um, it was mentioned in the presentations earlier, one of the questions that was um, coming up quite frequently was, why would I post problem or a hypothesis when I haven't yet had the chance to run my own experiment? Uh, wouldn't somebody else use that information to run an experiment quicker than me and to report on potentially new findings? Um, so I can fully understand the concept and the rationale, of course, behind the platform about the quick sharing of ideas early on and the platform that um, rewards best practice. They it, it rewards good quality research and it, it, it doesn't... Um, it has no relevance on whether the findings look uh, significant or if they are positive or negative, whatever. But on the other side, I can also understand where researchers are coming from, because in the current academic system, it is very important for them to have a list of publications, uh, because this is what supports their career progression. And thinking about how the publishing system works as well, that we know journals tend to favor research that reports something new, something significant, they would feel very frustrated if they let the idea in the public domain so that somebody else could use it and arrive at some potentially new important findings and manage to publish before them, uh, whereas they, the original, the, the people who had the original idea would be then at a disadvantaged position. So to make sure that I put their mind at ease, I explained to them that the um, ability to share the findings and uh, the ideas early on in the research process, it is a function, it is a feature of the, of the, of the platform, but it is not obligatory. So you can share your work in, in the platform when you feel ready to do so. And I think that helped them to, um, uh, to calm down. Um, another question that was posed is that uh, because there's no editorial team in Octopus, uh, how can they safeguard against uh, people plagiarizing, you know, presenting someone else's work as their own? And this is the point where I explained that the um, red flag system can help because as an open research platform, everything that is recorded there stays in the public domain. So I can't imagine that the researcher would want to create such a bad profile for them. Uh, some practical issues that were also raised during the discussion around how can people use the Octopus publication outputs in systematic reviews? Will those uh, outputs appear in literature databases, and if they appear, which element of the chain should they cite? I mean, taking into account that it it has um, seven different distinct elements, and you know, peer review on top of it, they weren't sure, you know, which one should they should they cite. And if we have time during the Q and A session, I think uh, that would be interesting to uh, to discuss. Um, 
another observation was the fact that since there are multiple, if there could be multiple items branching out of the preceding item, this could potentially become quite unwieldy and be difficult for them to surface uh, items more relevant to what they're looking for. And it would be useful to have a ranking system. Uh, and from my understanding, um, uh, this is on the radar of of the octopus design team and uh, they're looking at um, uh, integrating the rating system to create this uh, to, to integrate the ratings to create this ranking system and they finally had some feedback around some functionality improvements particularly around the accuracy of the search tool we, we realized early on that it was very important to also bring the senior uh, researchers on board uh, because the early career researchers and PhD students, they would most likely consult them before posting their, their work out there. And it was important for us that also senior researchers were aware about what this platform is about, uh, what it does, and understand what are their thoughts around this. So uh, we delivered a presentation to the school senior leads to describe the, uh, the platform. And um, the feedback that we received from, uh, from, from these more advanced researchers was a practicality around peer review. They felt that it might be difficult to achieve that in because it's a post-publication open peer review that in order for the reviewer to be involved in the process, they could either be invited or do that from their own uh, willingness, they felt that that could be quite hard to achieve in practice due to the high demand. And uh, they do this voluntarily, so it might, it, it might be difficult to pin them down to do it. They also had some apprehension around the early registration of ideas that it was mentioned earlier, and it was expressed by the PGR students. And something that it was recommended, they were particularly worried that if something is out in the public domain and then the um, researchers, they decide to uh, submit their work to a journal, the journal could potentially be rejected because it's already out there. And okay, we explained the bit that, you know, similar thing happens with preprint servers and most publishers, they are okay with it. Or it's, it's good practice if we can also check in advance with the uh, publishers you have in mind to make sure we get a confirmation around that but somebody came up with the idea that I think it's very um uh very clever that it's best if there could be a list of publisher publishers posted on the octopus website where it says that yes we are happy with your work being posted there we wouldn't reject your publication on that basis um the senior leads they also um they were wondering whether the octopus items would be referable. And of course, at this point in time, we don't know the rules of the next ref. So we, we wouldn't know, we, wouldn't, we couldn't say. But their, um, their uh, comment on that was that if that, would, if that would happen, that would be a massive driver for people to engage more with the platform. Uh, as a closing remark, I would like to say that there was quite a positive attitude, though, uh, towards the support of this initiative, however, and um, one of the researchers said that as long as we work together towards an internal process to make sure that posting there wouldn't jeopardize uh, publishing in a journal, then they would be more than happy to, to go for it. And um, Another researcher said that we ought to do the right thing and and give the example. So with that, I've come to to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, so that concludes um, the sort of speaking section of this workshop we've got today. Um, just quickly before we jump into the Q and A, I will mention if you are um, you know in some way interested in publishing on the platform, whether that's a quick research problem that only takes a couple of minutes or sort of a more involved publication. Um, if you did want some um, guidance on how to do that or have any questions about it or the platform in general for that matter, um, I'll drop my email in the chat here. Um, and now I think we can open up the floor to questions. So I'm going to start with a few um, asked earlier on that I don't think we quite got around to just to make sure those get a look in um, and we'll work our way down. So the first one we've got here is from Rachel, uh, and this is asking about um, how quickly will these red flags be resolved um, and talking about um, that there could be a bit of a problem with people flagging a concern with the publication purely because they disagree with the 
um, research stance on a particular topic. And I think uh, Evangelia actually mentioned um, something that perhaps answered this during her talk, which was that um, because the red flags like the other quality metrics are tied to your ORCID profile, there's some form of accountability for exactly who's been doing what. Um, so it's our hope that because it's tied to the researcher's identity, they would be um, disincentivized to misuse that system because ultimately it's going to go onto their permanent record, it's going to be publicly visible for everyone else to see, and ultimately it's going to sit there as a record that they may have misused that feature um, on the record that all the other you know, researchers looking at their profile can see. Um, so hopefully that's, um, that provides a bit of a counterpoint. In terms of how quickly they would actually be resolved, I mean, that's, I suppose, ultimately up to the, um, the parties involved, whether it ever gets um, resolved. Um, one thing to note is with the reversioning feature, publishing a new version, the red flag would still exist, but against the older version. So you'd have, now have a new version that doesn't have that red flag. There's still a record of it against the old one, but um, the new one now sort of has a, a new lease of life to go out and get its own quality feedback, I suppose. Um, we've also got a question about um, how would you envisage um, envision reporting the various aspects of activity on an academic CV? Um, so that's a good question. Um, you could theoretically list each publication as a separate item on your CV. However, for the sake of brevity, there are a few things um, we've been looking at doing. So one feature that's very much in the idea stage at the moment is the idea that as the author, perhaps, or, or perhaps as a reader, we haven't got to that stage yet, um, you'd be able to tie up a group of publications into a single sort of a single unit with its own DOI. So if we think back to the um, the example I shared in my demo, where you had this sort of chain of publications that was going in a sort of linear fashion, and then you had this secondary chain that's been added on, you'd be able to tie a loop around um, everything in that first chain, or everything perhaps that your team's worked on specifically, everything that you're an author on perhaps, um, and fence that around with its own DOI that, you, that you'd be able to use then to refer to that group of publications as a whole, instead of needing to list each one individually. Um, and we can have a look at how to do that, but perhaps that would make um, references to octopus publications on CVs slightly more compact. Um, uh, Amy's put a question down here is, um, about reviewers. So as well as anyone being able to add a review, um, are reviewers actively able to be invited by authors? Uh, or Octopus? Which the answer is very much uh, yes. You can you can invite other people onto the platform to review your work if you wish to. Um, and just like any other review on the platform, it would obviously be subject to um, to quality feedback mechanisms um, by readers. An interesting one here uh, from Penn. Um, building on Amy's comment, Penn is wondering if publishers and journals can actually use Octopus for parts of their publication and review process. Um, so we do have an agreement in place um, with the Royal Society for Open Science, um, where they will now recognize Octopus publications uh, and the associated peer reviews with them uh, for consideration for publication. So obviously with the editorial process, it's still in place to make sure that everything looks okay on those peer reviews. They will take peer reviews left on publications on Octopus and factor them in when considering an Octopus publication um, for a journal publication. Um, and we're, we're having talks with a few other journals about getting those sorts of um, systems in place. We hope to expand that so that we can get more and more journals having this, um, I suppose, official recognition of Octopus peer reviews and things like that, um, alongside the work we're doing just to reach out to journals to see if they would accept publication from something that's already been published in Octopus, um, a bit like they do with preprint servers. So there's a, a spectrum of journal involvement that we're going for, depending on how keen they are to interact. But so far, we're getting um, a fair amount of enthusiasm. Uh, we've got a question from Karen. Uh, what happens if I don't have a research question and it emerges from the data as in grounded theory? Um, so there's a few ways you could do this, I suppose. Well, well two really. Um, one is if that data already exists in Octopus on a publication, you could attach it to that pub that um, data publication. So you've got the results that's published elsewhere, and you could add a research problem onto the back of that um, to give derivation to that data set and say that's where it came from and take it out from there. Or alternatively, you could simply attach it to the topic. So um, you could attach it to whichever sort of discipline you're working in um, and then cite that data set um, as you would elsewhere. You can still obviously add references and things like that to your publication for things that aren't found with an octopus. Um, Kerry's um, hopped off, but she did put a, uh, a mention in there that the, the platform would need to be totally linked to others. Um, so obviously we're already 
very much tied to ORCID. We're sort of, um, we use that for all of our authentication. We pull in um, data about affiliations and things from ORCID, um, and we post things back via data site to um, ORCID profiles. Um, in terms of, I suppose, other platforms out there that we would, we would need to make sure that we um, work with, um, the hope we have for Octopus is that because it's a very sort of, I suppose, general platform, maybe the right word, um, where it's interdisciplinary and it's designed to capture the entire research process, as it were, um, we hope that we can become the place where things are tied together. So you could put in um, a fairly brief publication that links out to your full data set as it is on your data repository. You could have um, your you know, detailed um, sort of experimental design diagrams hosted somewhere else and bring them into that stage of a publication. And then you can use Octopus to tie that all together, not just with the single research chain, but with any other piece that you've added on, whether that's other research problems you've come up with whilst doing that research, whether it's alternative methods you just like to suggest, but haven't actually gone through with doing. You can use Octopus as the place to bundle it all together, including linking out to all these other systems that you may be using in various places. So we hope that Octopus is general purpose enough to tie things together and actually make it a bit easier to manage. And Marcus has put a point in here about um, the next ref. I haven't read the, um, the outline that was released today, um, so I probably need to go and have a look at that before I can um, do so much. Um, uh, speak to that too much but we are we are working to try and make sure that we have some sort of involvement in the next ref um if we at all can because that obviously would be very useful for people um scrolling on down ah there's an interesting question from emmanuel um so this is about if you're interested in contributing to the reviews of um methodologies in specific research areas to help better the research process um would we able to get alerts um about activity in there um so you can get updates of such inputs on the website um so this is a feature that we've got coming up um so our idea is that you'd be able to bookmark a particular publication um, or particular research topic, particular area of the system, area of the hierarchy effectively, and then choose whether or not you want notifications either for that specific item you've booked from or for that and anything derived from it. Um, and that will sit alongside a series of other notification options we give. So for instance, we um, give options to notify you if someone adds a publication onto the back of yours, if you know yours, someone else has derived something from you and things like that. Um, the overall idea being that you can keep um keep your ear to the ground i suppose on activity in whichever particular area it is you're interested in and so in the case of your question manuel you would be able to um bookmark perhaps that specific topic that you're interested in or particularly interesting research projects even within that topic maybe maybe you just want to bookmark a research problem and have a look at everything that comes after it um and then you'd be able to get notified about when anything um anything happens that builds on that I think that's all the questions we've got so far. Um, feel free to chat more in the chat or please do um, raise your hand or unmute yourself if you'd like to just shout them out. Brilliant. Okay, well, I think that's um, that's probably about it then. Um, so I'll, I'll drop my email in the chat um, again here, just in case you did have any more questions. Um, and also in case you'd like to get involved with anything with Octopus going forward. Um, so we're, we're obviously trying to make sure that the platform's developed very much in collaboration with the community. We don't want to start just throwing features out there without having a chance um, for people to give feedback on them and things like that. So we're doing various things at the moment to make sure that we're building things in the right way. One of the next um, very big ones is that quality rating system I mentioned. That obviously needs to be designed in exactly the right way so that people can assess a publication regardless of its discipline um, in a meaningful manner. It's sort of going to be relevant and uh, easily defined, especially in multiple languages, because of course we're going to be providing the platform in multiple languages. Um, so we're doing quite a lot of consultation on that at the moment, um, but there's plenty of other things we'll be getting involved with. So if you do want to, um, to sort of stay up to date, please feel free to send me an email um, and I'll be happy to get back to you with some information. Yeah, and thank you very much for that, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.